As we prepare to hear the words of the scripture, I invite you to join me in praying for God's illumination, God's light in our minds and in our hearts. Let us pray. Loving, gracious God, still inside us every voice but your own. Help us to put away all distractions. Help us to focus on you so that we may hear very clearly the word that you wish to say to each and every one of our hearts. In your precious and holy name we pray. Amen. So this morning we're going to read two sections from the Gospel of Matthew, one from chapter 4 and one from chapter 8, and they both coincidentally have to be verses 18 through 22 in those chapters. Two stories of Jesus and disciples or would-be disciples. Chapter 4, verse 18. As he walked by the Sea of Galilee, he saw two brothers, Simon, who is called Peter, and Andrew, his brother, casting a net into the sea, for they were fishermen. And he said to them, Follow me, and I will make you fish for people. Immediately they left their nets and followed him. As he went from there, he saw two other brothers, James, son of Zebedee, and his brother John, in the boat with their father Zebedee, mending their nets, and he called them. Immediately they left the boat and their father and followed him. And then chapter 8, verse 18. Now when Jesus saw great crowds around him, he gave orders to go over to the other side. A scribe then approached and said, Teacher, I will follow you wherever you go. And Jesus said to him, Foxes have holes, and birds of the air have nests, but the Son of Man has nowhere to lay his head. Another of his disciples said to him, Lord, first let me go and bury my father. But Jesus said to him, Follow me, and let the dead bury their own dead. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. We're going to start off with a little Bible trivia game today. All right? The question is, how many disciples did Jesus have? All right? Up, hands up, right over there. How many disciples did Jesus have? Twelve. All right, 12 is probably the standard answer. Everybody who agrees and wants to say 12, everybody who says 12 disciples, raise your hand. All right, there's a good many hands. All right. Some of y'all didn't raise your hands on 12, so let me see. Does anybody have another answer to the question? Brian, you didn't raise your hand. Always growing, okay. Some sort of infinite growing type amount, okay. Uh, that kind of gets you off the hook. You didn't have to nail it down, right? To one number here, right? That's, that's an interesting thought, though, right? If, if Jesus only had 12 disciples, what about Mary Magdalene? Is she a disciple? What about Mary and Martha and Lazarus? Were they disciples? What about Zacchaeus? Or Nicodemus, or Joseph of Arimathea, were they disciples? How many disciples did Jesus have? If you read the book of Acts, that's Luke's account of the days of the early church. You start out, and, and at the beginning, Luke says there were about 120 friends of Jesus who gathered around and they were praying after Jesus had died and rose again and, and went off to heaven. Well, of course, there, there's something, you know, something kind of fishy about those numbers 12 and 120, right? They're, they're very symbolic numbers. And it, and it seems that Jesus had a lot of disciples, but he called 12 of them to be special disciples. And that's why sometimes we call them the 12 disciples, right? Because Jesus was trying to say that the, the story of Israel was entering into a new chapter with his ministry. And then when you get to Acts and you get 120, well, that's obviously 12 times 10, right? And so Luke is not really so concerned if, if the number was 116 or the number was 128. 
it was about 120 because this is a new chapter in the story of, of Israel. So it's kind of, kind of interesting that how many really were there? It's not as easy a question as, as you might think. There were 12 special disciples, right? You had that representative role. They represented the 12 tribes of Israel, but there were others as well. Just put all that over on the shelf and we'll kind of ramble around and, and come back uh, to this idea before we get finished. How many disciples are there? But first, I want to kind of go back to our to our scripture readings. And, and this was a little bit different this morning. Most of the time when, when we read the Bible, we get one chunk from one place and we read that. But today we read two chunks from two different parts of the Gospel of Matthew, right? There are two different stories about, about being disciples. So the first story is the beginning of Jesus calling the twelve. It doesn't, it doesn't list all of them, but the, the first four of the twelve. And um, they say yes. They, in fact, it says they immediately left their nets and their boat. Okay, and that's, you know, you, you, you realize, of course, they weren't just fishing on, you know, at their lake house on the weekend for fun. This wasn't just a hobby. This was their livelihood. And it even says that the, the last two, James and John, left their father and left the family business to go and follow Jesus. Now, these 12, who were like the important symbolic group, just because they said yes to Jesus doesn't mean they were always really great guys. And they certainly weren't saints. And they certainly weren't perfect. And if you've read the Gospels very much, you've probably run across stories where the 12 argued with each other. They competed with each other over who was the best who was the greatest, who was the most important, and who Jesus loved the most. And the twelve didn't always get it. They, a lot of times, they didn't even understand the most elementary things that Jesus was trying to teach them. And then, as we all know, one of the twelve ultimately betrayed Jesus into the hands of his enemies. That was Judas Iscariot. What we sometimes forget is when Judas betrayed Jesus, the other eleven all ran away. So they didn't do a whole lot better than Judas did. So just because they said yes doesn't mean they were perfect, but they said yes to Jesus' call. And we have that, that other passage, and we have these, these other two men, and, and we don't really know, Matthew doesn't really tell us if they said yes or no to Jesus. Um, I'm inclined to think, um, and Josh said the same thing in the sanctuary, so I guess Josh and I agree on it, so that settles it. I'm inclined to, uh, Karen may have other thoughts about that, I don't know, but I'm inclined to think because we don't know these men's names, they don't give them a name, and we never hear of them again. I'm inclined to think that they maybe said no and left, but it doesn't actually say that. But it does say that, that these two men in these two short stories had issues with priorities. They had some serious issues to resolve. And, and in the first case, it was an issue with material possessions. This, this first man comes up to Jesus and he says rather confidently, Jesus, I'm going to follow you anywhere you go. And Jesus warns him, if you want to be my disciple, you won't have an air-conditioned house with a three-car garage in a gated neighborhood. In fact, you might not even have a house at all. And we don't know for sure what the man did with that, but we know at the very least he had to struggle mightily with the priorities in his life. The second man comes up to Jesus, and Matthew says he was already a disciple, and he says to Jesus, Jesus, you just give me a little bit of time. I, I, need, I need a few days. I need to go bury my father. And that was actually a very reasonable request in the ancient Near East, in the world of first century Judaism. Family was a, a supreme value. You know the Ten Commandments. The commandment number five says, honor your father and mother. Surely you honor your parents by giving them a proper burial. And they were pretty elaborate burial customs in first century Judaism. This was not an unreasonable request by Jewish standards in the first century. What was unreasonable is what Jesus said to this man. 
Jesus said to him, let the dead bury their own dead and you come follow me. That was not reasonable by any first century Jewish understanding. That's what Jesus said. Jesus said that he had to come before any other priorities, even family. Jesus had to take priority over this man's family. So these, these two little snippets of these two would-be disciples, are, they're, they're pretty stern, aren't they? Because Jesus is, is telling these men that if they're going to be disciples, Jesus has to be the number one priority in their life. Right? You can't just have a lot of good values and Jesus is one of them. Jesus has to be the supreme value if you're going to be disciples. In other words, Jesus is saying to these men, they have to want to be a disciple. They have to really want it. And you know, we, we get that mixed up sometimes. Sometimes we say we want things, but we want them in a very superficial way. We want them without investing ourselves in making them happen. We say we want things, but we really mean I just want them to fall into my lap. So, for example, some of us would say, I want to lose five or ten pounds. Or I want to bring my blood pressure down. Or I want to bring my blood sugar down so I can get off of insulin. I want to get my cholesterol down. We say that. But what we mean is, I want that to happen while I am sitting on the sofa eating Twinkies watching TV. Right? What we're saying is, I want that to happen with no investment on my part whatsoever. In other words, we don't really want it. We just want to want it. Right? And that happens in all areas of our lives. We say, I want to be on the football team. Or we say, I want to play in the all-state band. Or we say, I want to go to Harvard. Do you really want those things enough to invest yourself in? Or do you just want them to fall into your lap? Now, the same kind of thing happens around church, you know. We can go around Shandon and we can take a poll and we can, you know, probably 90% of us would say, I want a deeper relationship with God. I want to know the Bible better. I want more of God's peace in my heart. I want more of God's compassion. I want to spend more time serving the poor. But I still want to fish on Friday and play golf on Saturday and go to the lake on Sunday and watch football on TV five nights a week. And I don't want this to really impact my life. That's just wanting to want it, right? Not really wanting it. Jesus tells us, if we're going to be disciples, we have to want it. That's, that's the most fundamental thing about being a disciple. It, it's not rocket science. It's not, really, it's not really hard. You don't need three PhDs to be a disciple of Jesus. But you do have to want it. You have to want it enough to, to be willing to invest yourself so we have a, a wonderful opportunity coming up to help us be better disciples at Shandon. Now, I'll, I'll say right off, there are lots of ways to be disciples. I'll come back to that in, in just a minute. But we have one, one particular way coming up, and, and we call that D groups. And, and the D stands for discipleship, discipleship groups. And it's, it's a really great opportunity to grow as a disciple. Ruthie Taylor has stolen this idea from another church. And it's great. You, if you're going to steal something, steal it from a church, right? <laughs> if you're going to steal it, steal it from a good church, not a bad church. And she stole it from a good church. And she's improved it so that it, it fits at, at Shandon and it, it does what we need it to do. And, and we've had some people that have stood up in, in the worship services over the last few weeks. And they've been a part of some pilot D groups and, and they've talked about the, the impact in, in their lives. And pretty consistently, the testimony that they've given is this D group that I'm in has given me a village. 
It's given me a Christian village. It's given me a group of brothers or a group of sisters who support me on the one hand and hold me accountable on the other. And these folks have said, this, was, this, was, this has been a powerful thing in, in my life. And, and so we have this opportunity. They'll be coming up just a couple of weeks. There'll be a, a kind of a sign-up time. You can go ahead and register uh, at this point online. But there's a big sign-up gathering on Sunday afternoon, September the 10th, so two Sundays from today. Um, and, and these D groups are great. And, and like I said, they're not rocket science. And you don't have to spend 40 hours a week at the church. And you don't have to, you don't have to give away all your possessions. But you do have to want them, right? You have to want to be a part of these D groups. Ruthie is not going to cram these D groups down your throat. Here's a little secret she would like to. Leslie and I had to tell her, hold off. Ruthie, you can't cram those D groups down people's throat. You know? They have to want it. You have to want it. You can't say to yourself, I sure would like to be a part of a D group someday. That's just wanting to want it. But you have to say to yourself, I want this so much that I'm willing to invest myself in it and even adjust my priorities and I'm even willing to miss Jeopardy on TV one night a week so I can be a part of this group that might help me be a better disciple and change my life. So that's a, that's a big commercial for the D groups that are coming up and I hope we'll all think and pray about that. Now, it'd be a great thing, it'd be a wonderful thing if everybody in Shannon did that. But, but in fact, of course, D groups may not be for everybody. But, you know, there are more mission opportunities at Shannon, there are more discipleship opportunities at Shannon than, as, as my grandmother would say, more than you can shake a stick at, right? And, and so you just think about the opportunities to be a disciple that are out there. Right. We, we, we have Sunday school classes that need teachers, and we have teams that need coaches, and we have youth that need mentors, and we have studies that you can participate in, and we have mission trips for you to go on, and, and we have committees that need members to do the work of the church. And so whatever you end up doing specifically related to the groups. My hope and prayer is that all of us ask God to show us what's the next step in our life as a disciple of Jesus. How is it that we take that next step? How many disciples did Jesus have? How many disciples does Jesus have? Well, I don't really know the answer to that. I can't give you a number. But I hope it's a lot. And I hope that you want, really want, to be one of those disciples. Would you pray with me, please? Lord Jesus, thank you for calling us to be your disciples. We confess that we have a lot of other things that demand our attention, and, and some of them are important things. We confess that there are a lot of distractions in our lives. We simply pray that you would, you would speak to our hearts. You would give us the grace to understand exactly who you're calling us to be and what you're calling us to do. Give us the grace to put you first and foremost, absolutely, totally, and unequivocally first in our lives so that we can truly be the disciples that you have called us to be. We thank you and we praise you. In your precious and holy name. Amen.